Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are. I'm Derek D.C. Phillips, bringing you all things frightful as usual. And today we're going to be talking about a place, a specific place, in a town called Milledgeville, Georgia. Now, if you're not familiar with Milledgeville, back in the day in the North Georgia mountains, parents would actually threaten their children by saying, if you don't act right, I'm going to send you down to Milledgeville. And that was a very real, very valid threat that struck fear in the hearts of children. I know because my grandparents uh, talked about how their parents would threaten them with, with this punishment of sending them down to Milledgeville. Now, what did that mean exactly? Well, Milledgeville is known for a lot of things. It was founded in 1803. So it actually was the antebellum capital of Georgia prior to Atlanta. So before and even during right up to the end, just after the end of the Civil War, it was Georgia's capital. It is home to such landmarks as the old governor's mansion, which is a very interesting place to visit. They've set up a museum there now. Uh, they do really great tours that give you all kinds of historical facts. It is also the home of Georgia College and State University, so kind of a bustling college town. It's also known for that the home of Flannery O'Connor, one of my favorite authors. You can visit her farm as well. There's a museum there, a gift shop with all kinds of cool books. If you're a book hoarder, it's a little dangerous, uh, just to give you a little heads up and a warning. Uh, and it's also infamously home to Central State Hospital. Now, Central State Hospital was at one time the largest mental hospital in the United States. And it was founded in 1837 as Lunatic, Idiot, and Epileptic Asylum. So definitely the terminology there evolved as science evolved and as ways of describing mental illness evolved. Um, so you kind of even get an idea from the original name of when this place was commissioned the level of scientific inquiry here, right? And probably the level of treatment, um, not, not up to today's standards by any stretch of the imagination. Now, if you review records, which you can find online, uh, people were admitted and died there from all kinds of causes and, and would be surprising and shocking, you know, going in with uh, with the context of all of the medical scientific knowledge, especially surrounding mental illness that we have today. Uh, the very first patient who was admitted there actually did not, I don't think they made a full year. Um, and under a year they had died of maniacal exhaustion. Not exactly sure what that would translate to uh, in today's language. But that was that was very typical. People were dying of things that were very curable by today's standards, even abscessed teeth. So you can imagine, again, the level of attention and um, the the sophistication of treatment was just not there at that time. Um, it was also a place where veterans of the Civil War were sent when maybe they they came back and they they were left with, disabilities with challenges just the the trauma emotional physical all of the above and they didn't have families to go back to or families who couldn't really care for their needs they were sent to central state hospital so you get the picture pretty much anybody who did not fit in their their home life in their town life and their in their area of society they could be sent to central state hospital and that's why kids at the time this was a very valid threat because everybody knew about Central State Hospital. They knew about Milledgeville. That was that was, you know, the town name was sort of synonymous at this point in time with the asylum. Now, 100 years later, so it was founded in 1837, 100 years later in the 1940s, the 1950s, the population of inmates, because that's what they were, inmates, uh, once they were committed, left there by their families, that was it. So 100 years later, it grew to be so overwhelming, the population there, that there were up to 100 patients per staff member. And you can imagine, there was actually an expose done later that's, that officially declared that the majority of the staff there were not in any, by any means, 
capable of caring for these people. They were not qualified. They had no study. Uh, they, they weren't psychiatrists. They weren't psychologists. They weren't medical doctors. They weren't, they had no qualifications whatsoever. And, you know, even, even the staff that, that were there, uh, it's very scary to look back and read some of the accounts because that fine line between staff and, and patient, caregiver and, and, and patient was extremely blurred. I mean, the, the optics here, ethically speaking, were atrocious. Um, there's actually a story that I found where basically it explained that Central State Hospital was founded on this institution as a family model. And this was something that was popular, I guess, in psychology at the time um, and, and studies were going on. But essentially, patients were treated like family. And on the one hand, that sounds like, oh, OK, that's nice. That sounds pretty progressive uh, for way back then. But that didn't actually mean what we think today it would mean, right? It, it, we were not talking like residential treatment, that sort of thing. Um, in fact, one rich patient was actually living with the superintendent at one point and married into the superintendent's family. So these lines were so blurred I can't even imagine. And of course, that was a rich patient. So the wealthy patients were treated well. I can only imagine why, right? Funding, that sort of thing. And everybody else was just kind of lumped in. So you have this divide of the haves living in the on-site home of the superintendent. And then you have the have-nots who are just forgotten hundreds of people to one or two staff members at any given time let that sink in. And you can imagine the type of treatment, the quality of treatment. Again, the media that you have probably consumed surrounding this time period uh, is, is probably pretty accurate. So think lobotomies, think shock treatments, that kind of thing. Uh, whether it worked or not, it was a treatment that they suggested and they went with, and that was that, that was the treatment, that was the care that you received, whether you liked it or not. There was no, no fighting back, right? This was involuntary. And despite that expose that I mentioned just a moment ago in 1959, this asylum actually kept doing business um, and they had well over 10,000 patients in the 1960s. Now, moving into the later 1960s, there was advocacy that started going on on behalf of mental health awareness. And so public figures like Jimmy Carter, who is a Georgia native, um, he really started championing mental health rights alongside his wife, Rosalind Carter. And so you started to see a, a, a shift in public perception of what was going on in places like Central State Hospital. So you started to see uh, the focus move away from these asylums where we drop off our relatives and we never see them again to more residential treatments, even releasing patients back to their families when they were deemed well enough to return home. So there was definitely more attention. There were more eyes on these, these institutions. And because of that, things started to change slowly but surely, not, not immediately, but started to move in a better direction. Now, a fact that will blow your mind, despite this outcry from the public and all the attention that started going into mental health awareness, that sort of thing, and, and more uh, humane forms of treatment and more specialized treatment, Central State Hospital is still in business today. Now, I will say that their patient base dwindled to about uh, 30 patients in 2010. So you can imagine 10,000 patients in the 1960s to 30 or less patients by 2010. That was the last stat that I could find. Um, but, you know, just, just let that sink in again. Because the, the business that's being done there today um, is on the same campus that's always been used since the 1830s. And it's, if you look it up, 
it's it's really incredible that people are still going to appointments um, on this campus because the majority of the buildings there are totally abandoned. They are falling apart. There are no trespassing signs. And so the buildings there are still standing, but barely. There are dozens of them mostly situated around a main square. And that square is located on over 1,700 acres with 25,000 estimated unmarked graves. So strategically speaking, as operations started to shrink over the past few decades, certain buildings were just abandoned and left to rot on this property. That's, that's what happened, they're still there today. Now, it will be interesting to see what happens next in the area. I do know that Milledgeville conducts tours of the property and, and the surrounding area. So it's, it's very much a historical focus. So I don't, I think that Central State probably doesn't get the same level of attention as Waverly or Trans-Allegheny just because there hasn't been that focus on the ghost hunting aspect or the paranormal, uh, maybe because it is still functioning in some capacity. So people do recognize this hospital for its historical significance and it, there are attempts being made to preserve that and to serve almost as a living monument of how far mental health treatment has evolved. No, no necrotourism going on there like at other places. Um, and I, I imagine that is very intentional. I know that I went a few years ago and there were even police patrolling. So you could not just stop and hang out, go in any of the buildings. But guess what? You will see what's left standing today because we are going on a field trip to Milledgeville. All right, I am on my way to Milledgeville and it's about a two hour drive from where I live. Uh, so taking a, a more scenic route here. Hopefully traffic sounds and things won't get in the way of our conversation. But earlier I mentioned my grandparents growing up in North Georgia, more, more or less, that's where they spent the majority of their childhood. And my grandfather is no longer with us, but he passed down so many stories that I wish I had taken better notes or asked more questions, but you know how it is as a kid, you, you, don't, you don't know uh, till you know. You don't maybe appreciate those stories until it's, it's a little late for their full value. But anyway, my grandfather shared that actually Milledgeville was a, a personal topic, Central State Hospital again the the terms Milledgeville and Central State Hospital were pretty much used interchangeably by that generation in particular and there were several family members who had been sent away to Milledgeville and some had happier endings than others I wanted to tell you while I'm on the road about one story in particular that he shared and he always kind of went back to it um, he would talk about one particular aunt who, when they would visit her house as a child or where she lived with family members, he said that he remembered she would always be in her room. She never left the room that she stayed in. And she had this religious mania that if her feet touched the ground, the world would end. So she would sit in her chair. She would not leave her room. She might venture to kind of peek out into the living room when she knew they had visitors but otherwise she was terrified that if her feet touched the ground the world would be over this apocalyptic event would take place and so what's really fascinating to me is that of course today you would probably say okay well she suffered from agoraphobia there were some obsessive compulsive tendencies, but back in the day, you know, you went to Milledgeville, you got your shock treatment, and then if you were lucky, maybe you were sent back home. Um, so that was, that was one. And actually the other one that I really wanted to get to, my grandfather's family lived in Hiawassee, which is in the North Georgia mountains. It's about two hours north of where I live. So probably a four hour drive now around the turn of the century, the 20th century that is, the early 1900s, family of mine probably would not have had a car. 
So you can imagine a four hour drive in modern times with modern highways. I, I have no idea how long that would have taken in, in a buggy, essentially. But my grandfather always talked about these, these relatives and I have done my best to kind of vet some of these facts online. But of course my grandfather used nicknames. Again, I wish I had asked more questions, but based on some dates that I could find and some names that I think would be nicknames for uh, names in the census of that time, and the records from that time period, we're gonna call this Uncle Jace because there were several men named Jace, Jason, some kind of variation, so we'll call him Jace. And he was either an uncle, I believe, or a great uncle of my grandfather. Again, in that time period, you know, they were called uncle perhaps, but families as a rule were so large that those generational lines kind of overlapped. You know, the, the youngest of one generation was around the same age as the oldest of, of the next generation. So we'll just call him Uncle Jace for the sake of this story. If you're really into genealogy and you, you go put in my name and you start digging and you say, that's not accurate, this is, this is largely folklore, right? I'm sure it's like a game of telephone. Things kind of evolve, generations add add and subtract as stories are passed down. But anyway, Uncle Jace lived outside of Hiawassee with his wife, Minnie. And Minnie, during church on Sundays, would, in the middle of the sermon, just start shrieking. She would start screaming. And so you can imagine, I mean, if, if you're familiar with any kind of witch trials from back in the day, that sort of thing, that was pretty much chalked up to demonic possession. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but anyway, she was taken down to Milledgeville and committed by her husband. Really, that's all you needed back then. That's where the term gaslight comes from. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you watching know that. But if you don't know, uh, that dates back to, to a play slash film slash remake of a film um, called Gaslight. So check that out if, if you're interested in the subject. But anyway, I digress. Minnie was committed to Milledgeville. She was, you know, taken there on grounds of religious mania. But actually, doctors realized that she had tuberculosis, that somehow, and this is, you know, old, older generation speak, but they said that it settled in her spine. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not super familiar with tuberculosis, thank goodness. But um, that's what she was diagnosed with. And they said that the pain from this undiagnosed, untreated tuberculosis would just cause her to scream out in pain. And so in church, when she was expected to sit up straight in her pew, at hard wooden pew, I can only imagine, for an hour plus at a time, she just, she couldn't take it. And nobody, I guess, listened to her that she was physically ill. So she was committed to Milledgeville. Now, this is where things take a really sad turn. Once the tuberculosis was cured, she was fine. And so she started writing letters to her husband, Jace, who was about a four hour, again, drive today by day's, today's standards. And she got to the point, you know, she started out, I'm sure, saying, hey, I I'm fine now. I can't wait to see my family. I miss you. I miss the kids. Um, but he didn't, he didn't come and pick her up. So she kept writing letters, she kept writing letters, and by the end she was begging, please, somebody come and get me, and he never did. And we know about the contents of these letters because actually an, uh, a sister of my grandfather, so a great aunt of mine, kept these letters and other mementos in one of those leather travel trunks that it seems like everybody had back then. Um, so she kept these letters. She was very protective of them. So I never saw them, but she would talk about the contents and, you know, other treasure that she, she had tucked away there and documents. But anyway, these letters were, are, are still out there somewhere. I'm not sure where they are, but they are, I can confirm that they are, there were letters that were sent. And anyway, uh, you can only imagine, you know, if you were put away in a mental institution of 
the caliber of Central State at that time, turn of the century, I guess Victorian, you know, early, early 1900s, if you were not suffering from mental health symptoms going in, you definitely would be coming out or staying there until you died, which was what happened. So she wrote and wrote and wrote these letters until her death. Now, Jace was back up in his home in, in rural North Georgia, and I can only imagine he was a callous man to, to be able to do something like that and ignore that type of plea from your spouse, who knows what he was up to on his own up there in the mountains. And people say that after her death, he was haunted by grief. And so every night, I guess, or every few nights without fail, he could not sleep. And so he would get up, he would put on the large floppy hat that he wore, style of the times. He would throw on a cape in, in chillier weather in the North Georgia mountains, even in spring and fall, um, early summer, it gets pretty chilly at night. And so he would actually go out into the streets of town. He could not sleep. And so he would briskly walk or run just to do something to distract himself from this this grief or this haunting you know you can take that i guess literally or figuratively however you'd like but this was a habit that he would go out and and walk run around the streets talking to himself babbling incoherently until his death so his wife's death which i think anybody listening to this story could probably agree he was responsible for actually drove him to insanity and he eventually died so the next time you hear from me or you see see some imagery we will have arrived at central state hospital in milledgeville georgia